Ladies and gentlemen, record geeks, retired plate spinners, and millennials who want to impress their parents with their record collections. Welcome to the Rhino Cast Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Get ready for new releases, deep tracks, and conversations with your favorite artists and bands, and balloons for the kiddies. And now, your hosts with the most, Rich Mahan and Dennis the Menace. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, Dennis sits down with none other than Linda Ronstadt to discuss her new release, Live in Hollywood. Dennis, how are you doing today? I am doing great. I'm I'm really, really excited about this podcast. Not that I'm not normally excited about the Rhino podcast, but this one. It's pretty special. You got a chance to speak with a huge figure in pop music, somebody that really doesn't give very many interviews anymore. No, she doesn't give a lot of interviews, but I'm here to tell you that Linda Ronstadt is doing great. Oh, that's so good to hear. She is just vibrant and has so many stories to tell and this just had to be a two-part podcast and they're kind of definitively split great what are we going to cover here in the first episode we're going to be talking about linda ronstadt live in hollywood it is her first and only live recording That's pretty special in and of itself. Live in Hollywood highlights 12 performances from her 1980 HBO special that she did. HBO back then, they weren't the HBO of today. There wasn't the cable TV or satellite or anything of today. HBO showed movies. So this was one of the first things, along with comedy, that they broke out and tried to kind of advance something different than network television was doing. It's so great that they were able to unearth these recordings. And the producer of this set live in Hollywood, John Boylan, it's really funny, actually, how they did unearth these tapes. He was rinkside at his son's hockey practice, and he was talking with a Warner Brothers audio engineer. Like he says, I have no way of calculating the odds of finding the lost tapes through a chance encounter at a hockey practice. They must be astronomical, like winning the lottery, but... Everybody gets to win the lottery with this one because we've got them. This really is her greatest hits live because, you know, 1974 was Heart Like a Wheel. And then she had this ride between then and 1980 that not only was incredible from the songs that she selected to sing, but it defies genres. Well, Dennis, without further ado, let's get into your conversation with Linda Ronstadt. Would you introduce yourself, please? I'm Linda Ronstadt. You are? <laughs> Incredible. And you're not going to do the songwriter, rock on tour, owner of Tucker the Cat? Or... <laughs> I'm not much of a songwriter. I only wrote a few songs. Is Live in Hollywood your first and only live album? Did you have another live album? You know, I don't think we ever did make a live album. I don't think, I don't think you did. I, think this I is... like being in the studio so much. Why bother? You know? <laughs> if you yeah. make a mistake, you can fix it in the studio. Yeah, thank goodness. The recording happened, and we'll take you back, it was April 1980, and it was pretty much upon the release of Mad Love, and that was interesting. It was the turn of the decade, right? 1980 was an interesting interesting moment in time. Yeah, well, I was looking for something new to do. I, it was the year I went to Broadway and, and uh, sang in Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance. So I was on my way to do that, but I was just looking around for songs and... Wendy Waldman introduced me to an interesting songwriter whose name I can't remember right now. He was just writing these really good songs, so I recorded a couple of his. You know, I did the same thing I always do. I find a, an old hit that I love a lot, in this case, Hurt So Bad. And, um, oh, a song that the Hollies did. I Can't Let Go. I Can't Let Go. I love that song. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into some of the songs. So this was really interesting because it was an HBO special. And, you know, think about HBO 1980, you know, that's so long ago. 
at Television Center Studios in Hollywood. So it was a studio environment. Right. And your manager, who was really kind to me to get this set up, John Boylan, was the exec producer. So the two of you met at the Troubadour, and I believe he was working with Rick Nelson. Is that the story? Yeah, he had produced a record called um, She Belongs to Me with the, with the country rock band that was superb. It had Buddy Emmons playing pedal steel guitar. That was the Stone and, Canyon Rangers, right? Yeah, and then um, uh, the guy on bass was... The guy, the original bass player in the Eagles, Randy Meisner. So when the Eagles formed, I suggested Bernie Ledden, and I already had Glenn Fry, and he suggested Randy Meisner, and that was how the Eagles came about. So you asked him to produce and put the band together, but how did do you remember how John came to you and said, "So Linda, there's this this cable network called HBO, which nobody really, you know, wasn't really they were showing movies at the time." That's what HBO was. HBO was was cranking out movies. And so somebody said, oh, why don't we do a concert with Linda Ronstadt? Why don't we have it in a studio? Do you remember it all? John approaching you? Well, I don't. But I, I don't have a TV. I didn't have a TV for 30 years. I have one now. I, I, got, I bought a TV when Obama got elected. I said, I got to see this. <laughs> got tired of going to other people's houses watching make speeches. And I'd like to take it out again. It's too late. I was got me hooked by the leg. So... I didn't, the last time before I moved here that I had a television was when it was rabbit ears on top of the TV. And you, and my particular rabbit ears were broken. You had to hold it. If you want, you could only get three channels. And if you wanted to get PBS, you had to hold on to one of the rabbit ears. <laughs> Somehow. It, I remember those days. Up, I don't know why my body electricity made it work better. So I didn't watch a lot of television and I didn't understand HBO or any of that stuff. I just knew that I didn't like to be on television, so I always avoided television at all costs. Before we get into the songs, one of the the things you've said, which is kind of interesting, and I I read this in another conversation, you've said that you feel like your music's frozen in time. Yeah, when I sing, I sing something a little different here and a little different there. I mean something here, I mean something there. I discover something that's better. So when I'm recording, I'm just working it out. And that was just shortly after we recorded it. I was pretty familiar with the material, but you listen to it, you go, why was it, Why did we start it out so slow, or why is it too fast, or why, is it, why isn't the guitar pushed up there? The band. Kenny Edwards, of course, Stone Ponies, Danny Korchmer, who was in your... Best get... guitar player I've had in my band. Right, who was in your Get Closer video. He's so good. Right. Russ Kunkel, who's been on everything from every Simon and Garfunkel record... To, you know, he played on, actually, Russ played on, I counted, a dozen of your albums. Well, he played, he was the drummer of the hour from the 70s on to now. He was the session guy. Yeah. Was he officially Wrecking Crew or was he not? No. He wasn't, right? Yeah, he wasn't because because the other drummer was. He was in a band called Ronin. Ah. Keyboardist Billy Payne, Little Feet. I'm a Little Feet fanatic and Billy Payne was a huge part of that band. Dan Dugmore, Pedal Steel. Really good pedal steel player. The aforementioned Wendy Waldman. Really good singer and, and songwriter. And that, that Peter Asher guy. You know, that Peter Asher guy. He was guy. a spare parts man. Yeah. Keep a really good time. He, he'd play percussion. He could sing high harmony. He knew his stuff. We took him totally for granted. He knew his stuff. <laughs> he, 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 you know, he hung with the Beatles. He knew He knew, he his knew stuff. how to act on stage much better than I did. Every song of those 12 was a hit for you. People talked to you kind of like, okay, it's Linda Ronstadt. But I was trying to frame why I, from my original Capital single when I was 10, when I got it, uh, you know, I know exactly how much I paid because the sticker's still on there. I paid 67 cents for different drum on Capital when I was 10 years old. And you should not have to pay a penny more. That's right. But, but you know, but you can now know how old I am, right? So what it comes down to is I can't let go. I thought the, singles were 98 cents in those days. They were like 77 you, you went to a cheaper record store. I guess right? I went to a cheaper record store. Maybe I got a good deal or something. Maybe, yeah, you got maybe, a good deal. I bought a lot. Record, yeah. I can't let go. Now, this is, and you have a habit of this, and we're going to go through some of this. You have a habit of taking songs that another female vocalist, in some cases, has done, and they sort of made it. Like Evie Sands, right? Chip Taylor wrote the song, but Evie Sands sort of had a hit with it.
Hurts So Bad. That was a number eight single for you, but Little Anthony and the Imperials, right? Did the original. So good. I know you don't know what I'm going through. All the the things in terms of songs, Warren Zevon was kind of a challenge. His songs didn't meet the, I don't want to say meter, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you kind of said it was a tricky, tricky slope with Warren. It was hard to fit in his songs into my voice sometimes. So tell me more about what that. What I missed was Accidentally Like a Martyr. I always wanted to record that. Oh, what a great song. Oh, you could have killed on that. But but let, talk to me about not fitting your voice. Is it more because you were like this and he was like, because he was jittery? I need to have a long, high, I don't like short note songs. I don't like singing a lot of short notes. And he's jittery. He's like, bum, 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 yeah, bum. But, but, but poor Pitiful Me had a good chorus. Yes, it did. Oh, poor Pitiful Me. Oh, poor Pitiful Me. Oh, these boys won't let me be. Lord, have mercy on me. So let's do You're No Good because I'm, I'm, I'm going to rattle off a few things so you don't have to say them. You added that for a Troubadour gig to add to the ballads. Yeah, Kenny Edwards suggested it. We didn't have enough up-tempo songs and we had to have something to close with or something to open with. You know, you have to, like, I love to sing ballads. I'll just sing long, slow songs, ponderous songs. Heart right. Like a Wheel, I love Heart Like a Wheel. Or Talk to Me in Mendocino, any of those McGarrigal Sisters songs. Or Gershwin, you know. Sure. But I don't like to sing machine gun sounding songs. Well, like it's them. certainly like a balance to what's new. <laughs> it's slightly, slightly I know. different, right? You get a whole bunch of ballads. You have to have an up-tempo song, so you get a swing song. Yep. So yep. that was the up-tempo offering to the structure of the set. But again, back to originals. And this is where I kind of connect the dots. The, you know who the original, original, original was? Dee Dee Warwick. Really? Yep. Dion's sister did the original, original. And then, and then Betty Everett. Oh, I love Betty Everett. Yeah, but no, it was Dee Dee Warwick oh, originally. It was Dee Dee Warwick originally. And Betty Everett only brought it, I, I looked this up, to number 51 on the charts. So what's interesting about all that is that if you say to somebody, you're no good, it's a Linda Ronstadt song. Well, I only knew how to sing it like I knew how to sing it, you know. I didn't know how to sing very well at that time. People would debate that. That's very that's very kind of you to say, but people people would debate that. You know, I mean, obviously you could say you had great producers. Well, I thought Peter Asher did a great job on that production. I think that was the best production he ever did for me. Yeah. It was subtle. It had great arrangement. It had great string parts coming in at certain parts. It had great guitar parts that he and Andrew Gold did. Well, especially the end, the, to the fade. Yeah, that, that to the fade. all these songs because you like the songs but they get identified with you because you had the biggest hits with them I mean I can't think of any I can't think of very many artists that can say that the body of their work are songs they didn't write but but they had the biggest hits with them well it all seemed to me that not everybody could write their own songs you know there are a lot of mediocre songs out there <laughs> And, and there's a lot the of really of great them. ones lying around, sitting, you know, like Little Girl Blue by Rogers and Hart. I thought, don't leave that one languishing in an elevator going up and down. Yes. Get that song out of jail. So the same night that you discovered You're No Good, J.D. Souther brought you Blue Bayou, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. He said, yeah, they really sing this song. It's really good. 
Originally, we were going to sing it as a duet, and then he couldn't do it, and Don Henley wound up singing it on with me. But I, I love those, um, what's his name, the original guy that recorded it? Roy Orbison. The dark glasses, Roy Orbison. I love the way he sings. His singing is very operatic. And, it, you know, he gets really he goes, big, ah! long. Yeah. So that was perfect for me, like Blue Bayou. He didn't write that, but those long notes are good for me. I'm going back someday. And then Faithless Love was another J.D. Souther song. Yeah, he wrote such good songs. You know, we were living together, and he'd be in, in the living room pounding away on the piano or on the guitar, and I'd sneak around the corner and listen. And they were just beautiful songs, and I just totally took them for granted. Well, of course he writes good songs. He's J.D., he's a songwriter. Faithless love Like a river flows Like raindrops fall Were surrounded by Jackson Brown. Well, this is what I'm saying. You know, if, if, everybody probably you probably don't spend a lot of time looking back on your life. I suspect you're about about the now, but <laughs> but 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 still, because you have to be, because that's what life is, yeah. right? But but the people that you were surrounded by, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go a different way. So how do I make you? Which is also on there, Billy Steinberg. Billy Steinberg, that's that guy's name. He's, I love his writing. Like a Virgin, True Colors for Cindy Lauper, Eternal Flame he wrote for the True Bangles. Too? Yes, he did. He, he wrote, wrote I Touch Myself for the Divinals. Wendy Waldman brought him over to my house and said, Hi, this guy writes songs. And Wendy Waldman me, again. Played me, How Do I Make You? And I went, I like that. I'm going to record it. <laughs> When you're written about, the word country comes up again and again and again and again and again, right? And they say country. And now today we have alt country and we have country in this and we have, you know, we have all these genres. But if you take a song and you make it your own, How Do I Make You fits right up there with all the new wave songs that were coming up of the era. But that was just what I got from Billy Steinberg. I thought it was a good song. I know. I wasn't trying to do any ism, you know. But isn't, but isn't that the point? Isn't that, were you ever trying to do an ism? No. In I, all these songs? If I found a song, I really admired it, and it told my story, I had to sing it. Then that's even it. If, even if it didn't like me. Sometimes the song didn't like me. <laughs> and I couldn't sing it very well. I understand. Oh, it didn't like me as much as I liked it. But I thought, how did I make you as successful? I thought it was good. Back in the USA. You know, Chuck Berry. That's rock and roll. I love Chuck Berry. It was another one of those things you had to have an up-tempo song. And why do you like playing that on the guitar? Such a low Desperado, which again, you know, that was kind of the entree for for the Eagles, but you also very much made it your own. Well, I was just doing my best to copy Don. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard it, I think it was on their their record that they made. Maybe the record was called Desperado. It was a, they, the cover had a bunch of looked like they'd been uh, gunfight at the OK Corral, they yep. dressed up as cowboys. Yep. And I just thought it was the most beautiful song, and I really wanted to sing it, but I, Don had sung it so beautifully, and I thought they, they owned it then, and I couldn't take it. But then I did it anyway. Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? 
You've been out by your fences for so long now. Oh, you hot one. I know you got your feet. Do you remember anything about that moment in time other than you went to a studio and you did a live album and you were kind of like, ooh, a live show kind of thing? It was just really hot. And I was just afraid it was going to be on television. It was going to look bad. And we did our best, but it was so hot. They had the, the room lit with those great big lights, you know. Oh, yeah. And we were, I don't mean wine, but it was, you wouldn't put people working in a field in that kind of heat. God, I feel like a chicken fried steak, I swear to God. I'm going to introduce you to the band. First of all, on electric guitar and pedal steel, Dan Dugmore. Bob Glob on bass. Russ Kunkel on drums. <laughs> and standing behind Russ on percussion and high harmony, my manager and producer, Peter Asher. singer and songwriter and a wonderful guitar player, my friend Danny Korchmar. Someone who's been a friend of mine for a long time and we've played music for about, well, together for about 13 or 14 years. He's uh, also produced two beautiful records with Carla Bonoff. He's playing banjo and guitar on this tour. His name's Kenny Edwards. somebody that I first heard playing piano and he was with a band called Little Feet. His name's Billy Payne. <laughs> and finally, one of my dearest friends. I think she's a great singer. You know who she is anyway. Her name's Wendy, Wendy Waldman. <laughs> and if you give me to hear your conversation with Linda Ronstadt and people just don't get to hear enough from her anymore. Yeah, I've been having these conversations for more than a minute and I have to say this is beyond a life highlight, but wait, there's more. We have part two coming up in a couple of weeks. Folks, Live in Hollywood is available now. It is available on CD and LP and digitally. So however you like to consume music, your favorite format is available. And last but certainly not least, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next RhinoCast. Executive producers for Rhino, John Hughes and Lauren Goldberg. Produced for Rhino by Pop Colt and Rich Mayhan Promotions. All rights reserved.